Uh, our next speaker was, was, uh, was so critical to making sure that the support that those people received on the picket line arrived. So, so I'm really, really proud and I'm pleased to, to introduce a friend of our trade union, a friend uh, certainly to those people that was on the picket line in Hovis, and an absolute great comrade. Please welcome Confence to Michael Bradley. Cheers. I mean, first of all, I wanted to say thanks to Ronnie and Ian, everybody, to let us um, come along and say a few words today. Um, there's two times when you shouldn't want to speak, I suppose. First thing is just before lunchtime, um, so I'll try to keep it brief so people can get their lunch. But the second thing as well is after having some brilliant speakers, and I was just listening to people talk about Ricky Tomlinson speak yesterday and stuff, and how inspiring and stuff that was. And I think Ricky Tomlinson is inspiring to listen to because what he represents is work when working class people stand up and begin to fight back what, what can happen. I'm also on as a bit of a warm-up act, to be honest with you because tonight there's a fringe meeting that we're all organising, that one of you will be speaking at, and, and the Walkers Union are, 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 are organising, where a number of speakers are coming up from disputes that are going on around the country. You might have read about some of them. Uh, there's a little college in South, e in South London, Lambeth College. They are on all out strike at the moment, the workers there, because their contracts are being ripped up and new workers are asked to come in on completely new contracts, worse holidays, pay, conditions, and the rest of it. There's someone coming from Care UK in Doncaster. They've been out on strike, the care workers, for 34 days over the last few months because they are facing thousands of pounds in, in, in pay cuts. And there's a young bloke coming up from the Ritzy Cinema, which again is in London, right, stuff. It's one of these posh art house cinemas, right, and stuff about it, where, you know, you go in and you spend six pounds on a cup of coffee. The problem is, is the people who work there don't get the living wage, right, and stuff. And these people are coming up tonight to try and talk about their disputes and to try and ask, ask people here for, 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 for their, uh, ask people here for their support. I suppose particularly in the week when the World Cup is about to start, and if you're trying to advertise something, you normally need a celebrity, don't you? And I want to start with a little celebrity story, because on Saturday, I was in Hackney, in East London, at one of these cinemas that the Ritzy owns, right, and stuff, a place called the Hackney Picture House, and they were putting on a do for Amnesty International, brilliant calls, raising money for people around the world, right, and stuff, who are, who are, who are facing repression and the rest of it, and Eric Cantona was opening it, right, and stuff, the ex-Man United, United player, Eric Cantona, he's an actor now, was opening the stuff, yeah, all the main, all this Man City supporters started to boo in the corner, right, and stuff about it, but he went in and he did a brilliant thing, really, because rather than just bowling through, being a big, a big wig and the rest of it, the workers stopped him and explained what was going on. And instead of Eric going inside, he came out and he joined the picket line. And there was a bunch of 20-year-old strikers shouting, Ooh, ah, can't now. Right, so it was a marvellous thing to watch. And I think that spirit of solidarity is something that we've got to try and rebuild. And there's a lot of reasons to do this. I, I, I walked around yesterday, I was on the Lambeth College picket line at one point, then at lunchtime I went down to see a bloke called Brian Kennedy. I don't know if anybody's here heard of him, he's a rep, a Unite rep, at a place called One Housing, a housing association. He organised, he unionised the place, led a successful dispute, and so of course, what have the employers done? They victimised him. Right, stuff. They victimised him. His, it, the workforce ain't abandoning him. They were out on strike yesterday, right, and stuff, and pe people were, 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 were out supporting him. In, in central London, there were, were cleaners out yesterday, right, and stuff. Mostly migrant workers, right, and stuff. They work at the University of London. The University of London is worth millions upon millions of pounds. It is one of the top two universities in Britain, but it can't pay its cleaners a living wage. This is a disgrace, right, stuff about it, and also they're now making them redundant. And we're actually saying that Ian it, it, it was, was saying earlier on, the fact that at Tilbury Docks, right, stuff, it's like going back 100 years, literally. Dockers used to be the original zero-hours contracts workers. You used to queue up and get your work that day or get sent home. The fact that now this is happening at Tilbury in the 21st century, they're reintroducing what we won 100 odd years ago, really, sums up what we need to talk about fighting back. And this week, it seems to me is the beginnings of a fight back on quite a big level. You look at it, on Thursday, the firefighters are out on strike again over their, over their pensions. The ridiculous argument that firefighters are supposed to shin up ladders until they are 65, whatever and stuff, and this is all okay by the government. And on the 10th of July, it looks like there will be one and a half million people coming out on strike in a public sector over pay. <laughs> now, 
you, you don't need me to go through the other stories that are around this stuff. Why is there strikes over this? Because most people in the last four or five years effectively have seen their wages go backwards. That's what this is about. It means the things we gained are being ripped away from us. And, and people have, have, have raised things, but a couple of little facts and figures here, right? There are 1,000 people in this country now who have got as much money as a third of the entire national wealth. 1,000 people have got that kind of money. I saw a photograph yesterday it, 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 in a number of towns now, I don't know if people see them, they're introducing these studs now on the road, right, and stuff. So homeless people can't sleep in the, in the front of doorways. That's the result of it. We've got homeless people, but now the, instead of dealing with that, giving them somewhere to go, giving them a house or anything else, you just make sure, like they were pigeons or something, that they can't lie down and make a mess of things. And when, when the government talks about trade unions going back to the day, bad old days of the 70s and the rest of it, where we are is we're back to the bad old days now of the 1870s, if you're workers in this country, because that, that's how long the attacks have gone on for. Now, I, I wanted to talk about a couple of things, really. Obviously, what the whole conference is about is what do we do about this? And, of course, we want to protest about these things. And there are some big protests that are coming up. People saw it at the People's Assembly. I've got a demo in London on the 21st of June. And the TUC have called a demonstration in October. Britain needs a pay rise. And they're really, really important things. But I don't know if people heard it a, few, a, a couple of years ago. Mark Sawatka, who's the, who's the General Secretary of, 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 the, of the Civil Service Union, said something really good. He said, it's great if we march together but imagine if we struck together too, right, and stuff about it. And this is in lots of ways the bit that I, I want to I I try, try and talk about. Because industrial action, what happens at Wigan, collective power that, what, that we've got inside the trade unions, the potential we've got and the rest of it, right, is still there. And we're told all the time that it's not. We're told the trade unions are dinosaurs. They're things of the past, right, and stuff about it. And actually, if people remember before Christmas, there was this big debate uh, over the dispute that went on um, up at Grangemouth in Scotland about whether the unions were too weak now to be able to take on the employers. I want to say a couple of things about that, really. The first thing is, who makes the wealth in this country? Who makes the wealth? We do. Who keeps the buses running? Who keeps the trains going? Who cleans the hospitals? Who, who looks after the sick? Who teaches the kids and the rest of it? We do. And so when they talk about the gross national product and the rest of it, that's our sweat. That's our work, right, and stuff about that. That hasn't changed, no matter what the jobs are that we do. The second thing is we can win stuff. I mean, the reason why people talk about the Bakers Union all the time at the minute is because of Hovis, right, and stuff about it. The idea that you can beat zero hours contracts when everybody, they were writing whole theses in universities explaining to you why you couldn't beat zero hours contracts, and then you lot went along and beat them, right, and stuff about it. And therefore, it starts opening up a real debate. <laughs> See, it's true that our side is weaker than it once was. We know this, right, and stuff. If you look back at it, in 1979, there were 13 million trade unionists in Britain, right, and stuff. At the minute, there's, there's something like six and, six and a half million. There used to be 300,000 shop stewards in Britain at the height of the miners' strike in 1984. Now there's probably 100,000 or so. And we know, in, in, particularly in the private sector, there's 14, 15 percent industrial uh, unionisation, right? This ain't great in lots of ways over it, but actually lots of the stuff that Ian was talking about earlier is important because there are millions of people, millions of people, particularly young workers, who would like to be in a trade union, who would like to see their jobs defended, right, and stuff. And actually, what we have to try and talk about is how do we break into the sectors where those people are and unionise unionize them. And actually, one of the things that you've been talking about all over the weekend, what's happened at Greg's, the fast food rights campaign, the rest of it and stuff, is about how do we break into places that we're told are impossible to organise. Because there's a simple thing, isn't there, re really, about it, is people join trade unions, but they join trade unions when they think the union does something for them and that they can win. And just look at when people join unions, it's when unions are fighting. On a local scale, people join, you know, uh, the last couple of weeks I spoke to somebody at Edinburgh College, little college up, up in Scotland, they had a massive win against their employers, what and stuff. Their union branch went up by a third. But in 2011, when a big strikes were happening over pensions, unions put on hundreds of thousands of members in this country. It wasn't about mergers. It wasn't about the idea that we just had to keep reshuffling the deck chairs. People join unions, it seems to me, when, when, when unions fight. The issue of the anti-trade union laws has been brought up. They, they, we all know that they are devised here to cripple us, to make it difficult for us to organise and the rest of it. Of course we've got a campaign against them laws and the rest of it. But also, sometimes you can break them. 
quite a stuff about it. And actually, quite often, they're only as strong as we, we can allow them to be. One thing I was involved in, people might have read about a year or so ago, was a big dispute with our electricians who were fighting a big attack on, on, on their conditions, a Besner agreement that was going to see their pay cut by something like a third. There were occupations, there were unofficial action, there was all sorts of activities went on, which I know can sometimes make you worried if, you, if you're leading the trade, the trade union and stuff. But also, it's interesting that they won their dispute and, and, and unions themselves, Unite and other unions themselves, were not, were, were not sequestrated at any, ch at any chance. Of course, it makes a difference who runs your union. Don't get me wrong, right, and stuff about it. The reason why I kind of lefties like me are invited up, you know, by, 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 by Ronnie, right, and stuff, or Marks or Watco or other trade unions, it makes a massive difference who, who, leads, who leads your union. But to be honest with you, even the best general secretary is only as good as the rank and file. That's the truth of it. Only as good as how organised people are, people, people are on, on, on the ground. And the argument we want to try and raise really inside the movement is how we inc inc improve and get together the confidence of ordinary workers both inside in individual unions but also across the unions. And what United Resistance has tried to do is three things, I suppose. is to try to build solidarity for people when they are out on strike and fighting. Secondly, to try and build support, real support, for people when they need it on the picket line and the rest of it, like at Hovis and at other places, but also providing a place where we can talk and debate what the best way, what the best way forward is. This is just the last couple of things I wanted, wanted to say. Uh, lots of people have raised it in the discussion. One of the things I think at the minute that is, is happening is there's a real systematic attempt to divide our side. Right, and stuff. They're trying to do it really in two ways. One is over benefits. At the minute, you would believe that, for example, disabled people in this country were terrible people who really just want to take your money all the time because always there's stuff on, on the TV about living allowance, all the rest of it. They try and divide that way. The second way is what lots of people have risen, what's come out of the European elections with UKIP and the rest of it, right? What they want us to do is turn on each other and blame one another. So we're supposed to blame migrants, different workers, etc., etc. The truth of it is, as most of us know, right, I mean, personally, you might be people are different in the room, right? I'm one of a, a group of seven million migrants in this country. We're the Irish, right, and stuff about it, really. This country's been built on migration at every stage and stuff about it. There's something for people who work in the hospitals, the schools, etc., etc. If we let these people divide us, if we do turn on each other and start blaming, the only people who benefit out of that are the Tories and the bosses, it seems to me. And that has to be a central message. And one of the arguments from people talking about Labour, I think Labour have to come out strongly against this stuff. And I think the problem of it is that Ed Miliband over, over, the last, over, over the last period hasn't been. Last two things, really. There was a brilliant debate, I thought, this morning about the issue of Labour. And people in the room have obviously got lots of agreements and disagreements on issues about whether to fund Labour, to remain supporting Labour, etc., etc., and stuff about it. But there's one thing I think we should all try and agree on, is that we can't wait for Labour, right, and stuff about it, for two reasons. First of all, because the attack on us is now. We know that every time we go to work, we're bullying employers, the attacks on our pensions, pay, and everything else. But the second thing is, even if Labour are elected as they are at the moment, Ed Miliband said something simple. He said, we're going to stick to Tory spending laws, pledges. And that will mean no matter whether they want to do it or not, there will be cuts, there will be attacks, and, we, and, we're, and we're going to have to talk about how, how, we, how, how, how we fight back. And that's why we do need a fight back on a big scale. Over the last couple of years, I've been to lots and lots of trade union conferences where motions have been passed about the idea of coordinated strikes and general strikes. Why is that? Not because people are just doing it for the sake of it, because all of us know one basic thing, really, at the minute, that we, it's crazy not to stand together. Right, stuff. We're much stronger when we come out together and stuff and organise together and coordinate. And at the minute, I think we've got the chance for that again. Right, and stuff about it. We're, we're on, on the 10th of July, if there are one and a half million people out, it's the chance for us to start to coordinate things again and get a real movement going against the employers and the government, really, and stuff. They say they're not worried about the unions. Why do they keep bringing in more anti-union laws if they're worried about the unions? That's the truth of it and stuff. And we've got a chance to get this going again. But last time round, it seems to me, in 2011, some people at the top of some unions didn't want to push it as far as it could have gone. Right, stuff about it. And we've been paying the price for that, I, I think, over, over the last period of time. And this time round, I think we have to say that it's time really to start talking about taking on the government in a really serious way, starting to coordinate the fights and start to, 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 show, that, to show them that the unions have, have got teeth. And just, just, to, just to finish, really, I just want to go back to Eric Cantona in a way, because if you think about the, if you think about the kind of arguments that, are, that, that are, have been brought up, really, over the, last, over the last period about the trade union movement stuff, that it's 
it's a, do it's a dead donkey in many ways. It, it can't attract new layers of people and the, and the rest of it. If you saw what the picket line looked like at Hovis, or you saw what the picket line looked like at, at Ritzy, or you saw at Lambeth College and other places, right, and stuff around it, you can see the potential in lots of ways for a new trade union movement, right, stuff that starts being the people who you look to if you want, a ju if you want social justice, who you look to if you want to see someone who's going to stand up for you, but also that can have a real, real effect or, 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 or on improving working classes, work, working class people's lives. So I, I'd really encourage as many people who, as possible to come along tonight, to talk to the Lambeth people, to talk to the Ritzy strikers, to talk to the Care UK people and stuff. I'd like to bring solidarity from United Resistance to the, to the conference. I hope you have a brilliant rest of the conference. But I just think you can't underestimate the issue around, around Hovis and what it means. You guys might be fed up a little bit with talking about Hovis. It gets brought up, all the rest of it. In the movement, people ain't at all. Because it seems to me it gives people hope that no matter how bad they try and smash up our contracts, how bad they try to treat our young people, how bad they try and attack us, there is an answer that working class people have got. And that's strike action, it's solidarity, it's the ability really to pull the plug on the employer and to beat them.